Tisztelt egybegyűltek, szeretném ebben az előadásban egy kicsit tágabb kontextusba helyezni azt, amit ma ünnepelünk. Ez a tágabb kontextus meggyőződésem szerint rendkívül fontos. Ez a, ez a tágabb kontextus meggyőződésem szerint rendkívül fontos, mert ez az, ami nagyjából leírja azt, amit úgy lehet jellemezni, hogy a genetika kulturális üzenete. And I'm afraid from now on I'm going to talk English, because this is an institute for advanced study, and I, I think that this is a courtesy, courtesy for the... Uh, thank you very much. Uh, always at your service. Um, so... Um, let's see then, let's get into business. The first thing that I want to emphasize is uh, this very important methodological link. Uh, these are two renowned gentlemen. Uh, one of them, of course, on the left-hand side is Imre Festetic. On the right-hand side is Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Um, Leibniz, of course, has had a tremendous impact on mathematics and the natural sciences, as well as philosophy. It's not so well known, by the way, that Leibniz also had a penetrating insight into the nature of life. Uh, he at length discussed the problem of what he called divine machines. Now, for him, divine machines were the living beings. Why divine? Because he didn't have an idea about evolution, so therefore, Uh, living organisms must have been divine machines. But he asked the very pertinent question, what is the main difference between man-made machines and divine machines? And he came up with a suggestion that the very difference between divine machines and man-made machines is that if we cut divine machines into smaller pieces, we can still see that something is happening. You know, muscles are still contracting. Obviously, there is some metabolism, as we call it today. And then he said, obviously, the gadgets, the little parts in the divine machines are somehow infinitely divisible, and they remain functional. Now, what does it mean? It means that, in a way, in the footsteps of the ancient Greeks, just by poor reasoning, He figured out that there m must be something like molecular engines. Huh? I mean, nowadays we could say, yeah, of course, he was thinking of something like enzymes. Of course, he didn't know. I mean, chemistry was not in the stage to formulate this concept. But by deduction, he was clear about a very important aspect of the nature of life. The, the second thing, the philosophical uh, dictum that is very known, this theoria cum praxis, is that we have to connect theory with praxis, and e exactly with practical considerations, practical work. And this is very uh, remarkable that Festetic was, in a way, uh, a person who was following this dictum, whether consciously or unconsciously, could have known about Leibniz easily, uh, that this is something that needs to be done. We, need the, we have the practice of animal breeding, and we need to figure out what is going on in terms of theory. Uh, as you have heard from the brilliant lecture of um, Peter, there are a few clear items in Festetic's work, such as the importance of nature over nurture, That's a long debate. We are going to come back to that. Then the laws of dominance and segregation. Uh, we will see a slide explicitly about this problem soon. Inbreeding is not detrimental with appropriate selection. This was a very important practical thing. And also, you can show it by theory that this is indeed the case. Occasional mutations, as we call it, contribute to variation. And very importantly, which is missed by my dear fellow biologist too often, he pointed out that these things need a mathematical investigation in the future. He was not in the position to do so, but he was clear about seeing that something like that is going to happen and it should happen. Now, here is his greatest successor, as we heard in the previous lecture, Gregor Mendel. Um, and The important message 
from Mendel's work is the factorial nature of inheritance. So here are the, the, the what we call Mendel's laws today. Um, first of all, um, a, a little bit of terminology. You, you must have heard about genes, you know, that uh, these uh, pieces of genetic information that we are inheriting from our parents. And we, you, you must have known that we are diploids. So everybody has a copy, which one copy comes from the father, one copy comes from the mother. That is what it means, diploidy. And the, the form, two forms of the same gene may be identical in effect or different, coming from one parent and, uh, or from the other. And this is what we call alleles different forms of the same gene. Uh, this, uh, it's good to remind ourselves, it's not only biologists who are sitting here. So for example, the, you have the law of segregation, two alleles for each gene, any gamete contains only one of them, right? So this is a diagrammatic representation. The, the color means, means the phenotype of an imaginary uh, flower or organism or whatever. And then you will see that uh, everybody the, as an organism diploid, but then, you know, when you are doing the pairing and you produce the next generation, the gametes are uh, containing only one copy of the gene. And then if you have random mating, and in this case of random mating, you are forming actually a, a distribution. Then uh, there is the law of independent assortment. All these or separate traits are passed independently of one another. Now, this is actually remarkable because later, many apparent uh, deviations were identified from Mendel's laws, uh, but, the, but they were apparent more than real. But the, the one real deviation from Mendel's laws was that, in fact, they found out that many of the genes are not segregating independently. And now, as we know, that they are like beads on a string. They are on the same chromosomes. That was another revolution in genetics by Morgan. And by that time, you know, the, 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 the sacred organism of genetics has changed again because that revolution happened in the so-called fly room of Morgan in the United States. And then this led you know, to beautiful books in the 50s, uh, for example, with the title Vesedelmes Mendelismus Morganismus Ellen. I am sure that uh, my learned friend, uh, Professor Polk, uh, is amused by uh, this allusion. Uh, but, you know, uh, science is still uh, progressing despite all the attempts of some other people. And then, of course, as it was mentioned, the law of dominance, the recessive alleles will always be masked by the dominant alleles, which means, you see, that, for example, in this case, you see, you have got one copy of, of, of the white and one copy of the red. And this case, the red is dominant, so everybody is going to, uh, is going to be uh, red. And then when you go to the next generation, then, you know, because of the segregation, uh, you will have in the generation two, you will have the reappearance uh, of the white phenotype because, you know, the two recessives are together white and white, and there is no red allele which would dominate over it. Beautiful. Um, uh, now, what did influence Mendel? That's actually very, a very important question to ask. Uh, you have to realize a few things from his, uh, from his uh, past. Uh, for example, he was influenced heavily by sheep inheritance. Uh, first, he was attending the Palatsky University in Olomouc, the Faculty of Philosophy, at the Faculty of Philosophy, the Department of Natural History and Agriculture, where Johann Karl Nestler conducted extensive research on hereditary traits of plants and animals, especially sheep. So he was actually studying there. But later, his master at the monastery was not satisfied with this kind of education, and he made a brilliant move. The brilliant move was don't study biology. Go to study physics. I mean, it was absolutely important. I'm convinced that if without that kind of training, he would have failed. So actually, and Doppler was uh, his professor at the University of, of Vienna. And then later, uh, the, the, the Ebbot, 
Knapp authorized Mendel to carry out a study in the monastery on two hectares in an experimental garden, but even that garden was established by his predecessor Knapp in, 19, uh, in 1830. So this is, you can see the, there, are, there were different kinds of very important influences, but uh, there was another one, which again, uh, if you consider general biologist at the time, probably he didn't know too much about it, and that was the chemical uh, nature of qualities. Uh, chemistry was already in a fairly developed stage at uh, the time, and uh, especially, there was a science of chemical stoichiometry, which is the calculation of reactants and products in chemistry. And they, know, they, they, they knew already the law of definite composition. A, give, a given chemical compound always contains its component elements in fixed ratio by mass and does not depend on its source and method of preparation. Now, this is very important because Mendel had an idea that if you combine different primitives, factors, if you wish, in certain fixed proportions, and the fixed proportions are very important, you are going to get to different qualities, and you can do it again and again. Mendel's insight was basically a stoichiometric paradigm. It's a generalized stoichiometry. Now we know that it's even more related to chemistry, because if you look into the nature of genetics, there are molecules behind it, you know. There is DNA that carries hereditary information, and so on and so forth. One more remark I want to say. I want to go back to, to the previous slide a little bit, because this is fascinating. Um, you see, sometimes uh, people fail to make the discovery because they think that they have made a reductio ad absurdum, huh? reduction to something which is incredible by not realizing that they just should have carried the thought one step further and they could have made the discovery. So, for example, in Aristotle, with full reverence, there is a passage which says that force uh, is necessary to maintain velocity. This, we know that that's, this, is, this is not true. Force is important to have acceleration. But Aristotle says, force is obviously important huh, for the maintenance of velocity because if it wasn't the case, then a ball that we would launch on the table would carry on in a straight line with constant velocity forever. Huh? He makes explicit Newton laws and he rejects it immediately, of course not considering that there was another force in effect, which was of course the friction between the table and the, and the ball. Now this kind of strange reductio ad absurdum happened at least twice after Mendel, uh, people who didn't know about Mendel. One was Francis Galton. Galton was Darwin's nephew, a very important person uh, in what we call quantitative genetics. He was also very much interested in the hereditary aspect of intellectual capacities, uh, and his famous book, Hereditary Genius, you know, is still you know, one of the landmark books. Uh, but in his uh, book, The Hereditary Genius, I think it's in that book, he says, well, I mean, suppose that there would be some particular things behind inheritance, and then he says, okay, let's just suppose that there are 16 different types. Or, and then he goes, okay, let's consider if, it, if, it's, if it's four different types. And then he comes to a, a ratio, which is a Mendelian ratio for two genes. And he says, but we don't see that, so obviously this must be wrong. Hmm? The same happens with August Weissmann probably the most important evolution thinker after Darwin. Huh? He again thinks about it. He actually was absolutely sure that uh, heredity means the passage of information. Let's not go into that because that's also fascinating how he was convinced himself about that. But then again, he, he, he fiddles around with the idea of particulate 
factorial inheritance and rejects it in the same way as Galton independently rejected it. And then, of course, as we have heard, then comes the, the time ultimately when people realize that they were sitting on the, 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 the horse basically backwards. Um, okay, now uh, uh, I want to make a few remarks about the evolutionary uh, impact of all this. So this petrified gentleman over there, uh, which actually, who was actually a, 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 a pussycat in his behavior, you know. And Newton was, well, how should we put it um, politely, not, very, not a very kind person, right? I wanted to say something else. But, but this guy, Darwin, was a very kind person, by the way. Um, and uh, he knew this slide, or the contents of this slide, 20 years before the publication of The Origin of Species in 1859. It's an interesting story, but it's not an evolutionary talk. Why it took him 20 years to get to the book? But, but it's important that he figured out very clearly, we have his notes. Oh, by the way, this is very important historically. All historians, please listen now. Uh, it's an absolutely detrimental thing that all the all the notes of Mendel have been burnt. Do you know why? Because his, his successor in the Abbey inherited a legal case from Mendel, and there was a text dispute, a text dispute between the monastery, the school of the monastery, and the local authorities, whether the monastery should pay taxes on this or whatever. And then they came to an agreement, and then the abbot says, as as a sign of my goodwill, I'm going to burn all the previous documents, you know, that are associated with this matter. And with that, he burnt all the notes, including the genetics and whatever. You know, this is the uh, very high level of competence and appreciation. But, but the most important thing in this figure is that what Dar Darwin didn't know uh, how inheritance was, but he, he knew that it was very important. How did he know it? He knew it actually, again, from practice. He knew it, first of all, from uh, animal breeding, artificial selection, and he also knew that, you know, the sperm of a winning male horse was incredibly expensive, you know, in England at the time. Everybody knew that there was something important in it that can be carried on to the next generation, right? That is all what he needed, fortunately, because otherwise he would have uh, gotten stuck. Um, right. Uh, Darwin had a problem, though, uh, when he was thinking about, he was, he was thinking about everything uh, re regarding the biological processes. But when he was thinking about inheritance, unfortunately, he took uh, uh, up the idea of a previous thing, which is called blending inheritance, right? So um, if you have two different colors, then, you know, in the next generation, uh, you know, the, the color of the kid will be something, you know, bit, I mean, intermediate, you know, between uh, the two parents. Now, if you carry on this procedure, you know, the information, the differences just will disappear. So he was concerned and confused about this blending inheritance problem. But then, you know, when Mendel was discovered, that was good for inheritance, but immediately that was a, there was a surge saying what Mendel said, sorry, what Darwin said must be bullshit because we know that inheritance doesn't work in that way. There is no room for evolution. And it was these three people, giants of the new fields called population genetics, the quantitative theory of evolution change, who figured out that Mendel's laws combined with the ideas of mutation, recombination, and selection can give you a quantitative account of biological evolution. It's as important as the establishment of Newtonian mechanics. And I mention this because Feshtetich <laughs> did mention that these things you need a mathematical analysis. By the way, um, just for the biologists and, and also maybe for others, um, you know that there is this phenomenon still that uh, I see it at the university, that many, many biologists come to the university after the following reasoning, you know, I, I like nature, but I hate mathematics, so I go to biology. 
And now in, in Darwin's autobiography, he mentions that there was a period when he was trying to become a mathematician, and then he said it was uh, off-putting for him, and he was very reluctant to continue. And this is what usually biologists cite, but this is not the end of the passage in the biography, because he says, this reluctance, however, was very foolish, <laughs> because mathematically trained and inclined people seem to have an extra sense as opposed to common sense about the processes of nature. So this is the extra sense that these gentlemen, including, I mean, let me say, because it's, uh, I like it. So he is actually J.B.S. Holden, my intellectual grandfather. So there is only one person uh, between us in the intellectual line. Um, now, uh, the, the, okay, A another aspect, and that's the last thing of mathematics I want to mention here. Um, it's very interesting that I just read a few days ago, there are, there, there are these you know, internet-based fora where you can ask different questions, right? And somebody asked the questions, what are the equations that the public <laughs> ought to know much better than they do? And one of the responses was immediately this, the breeder's equation. Huh? It's absolutely fundamental. Um, okay, so I know Stephen Hawking's rule that every line of equation reduces the remaining audience by half, but still, I, 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 would, def I would still uh, like to show it. So this is what is called the response to uh, selection. This is the selection differential, and this is the, the, between the response uh, and, uh, and the selection uh, force, you know, you have the so-called heritability, the quantitative e effect of inheritance. This actually explains what I'm talking about. Here is the parental generation. We assume that this is a quantitative trait. I mentioned the quantitative genetics in relation to Galton. And then you select, you know, you take out only certain phenotypes from the population. Let us say, I mean, this measures the the length of your hair or tail or whatever on which you want to make the selection. You, you, you select, you take out a subpopulation. These are the selected parents. They will also have, I mean, in most cases, a, a distribution. And then you let the children grow up, and then you will have usually a distribution which is further to the right than the parental generation, but not so much uh, far to the right than the selected parents. They, these would be identical if inheritance was something which was absolutely accurate, right? If not, then you will have something in between, and this is uh, one of the foundations of quantitative genetics. Now, this I have to mention for the following reason. Uh, people who are also studying um, human behavior are very much interested in these three things, the so-called additive genetic effects. I'm just simplifying what you basically inherit. What is the effect of a common environment and what of, what of the effect is of the unique environment? Now, I want to say that despite the misunderstandings of certain people in sociology and whatever, uh, peop uh, people in quantitative genetics knew that these are things that always happen to certain proportions. N I mean, nobody in his right mind thought that everybody, everything would be inherited to, uh, with a correlation of one, but somehow that was missed by, I don't want to uh, give certain names, but uh, probably you know whom I have in mind. But uh, this is now, this kind of investigation then now is carried over to something which Hunkish was very much interested in, because if you see the different kind of things here, for example, here you see the trust game, the dictator giving, huh? leadership, aggression and means, means the ultimatum game, political attitudes, these are the heritability estimates and this is taken from a very prestigious journal of neurobiology. These are the heritability estimates for these different traits on certain populations using the, uh, the, the, the armamentarium of quantitative genetics. And you will see, depending on the trait, the heritability is very different. Uh, I mean, the, the, the yellow 
uh, colon is, uh, you know, for the correlation, is for the monozygotic twins, and the, and the red is for the dizygotic twins. Dizygotic twins, you know, are not more genetic related to each other than uh, normal brothers, but, you know, they may or may not share the same environment, so you can figure out the different effects. And this is the games that are mentioned there are actually uh, later developments in the game theoretical formulations of social dilemmas and so on. So this is why I mention it as a courtesy to, uh, to Hankish and also as a kind of uh, uh, smooth transition to the topic of this afternoon. Um, now finally, I want to entertain you, this is the final scientific slide, about uh, whether there are other concepts uh, that we need in order to study hereditary phenomena. Obviously, there is one uh, which, which comes to one's mind. You see, when you are a fertilized egg, a zygote, it's just one cell. Then, you know, the embryo grows, and there will, you will have something like cell differentiation. All of a sudden, there will be liver cells, neurons, kidney cells, whatever. Some of them are dividing easily, like liver cells. Neurons don't, and that's a problem, as we know. But uh, liver cells do divide, and unless you have drunk too much, uh, then uh, the division is fairly normal. But if you look at the genetic material, the DNA in a liver cell, you will see that it's the same uh, genetic material almost uh, as you find in the neurons, for example. So, What's the difference? So there was no state of being a liver cell before. During development, you have the state of being a liver cell. And upon division, you can inherit. You can pass it on to the next generation, but the difference is not in the DNA. You see, now we know that there are switches in genetic regulation. Just think of like switches of this. So you can switch genes on, and you can switch genes off. And this state of being switched on or switched off can be passed on to the next cell generation. And that is what we call epigenetic inheritance. It's a very important, very exciting uh, field. But this, this was just a footnote, but this is what I want to say uh, here. So um, I was told, because I didn't know him, my intellectual grandfather, uh, J.B.S. Haldane, uh, usually started his lectures uh, about genetics with the following statement. You can say two different kinds of things. You can say that I, I inherited my watch from my father, or you can say I inherited my nose from my father. And the geneticist exclusively is interested in the second statement. The first one is completely irrelevant. Uh, probably not so. Um, already Darwin was uh, concerned with the example of the earthworm. Do you know the earthworm is uh, sometimes some, something like an ecosystem engineer, right? So the earthworms are uh, transforming the soil and the plants can utilize and if the plants are uh, growing well, they actually can complete a cycle. Right? Now, in the, in the last 10 to 15 years, there is there are two notions that uh, are gaining momentum. One is what people call niche construction. The other one is ecological inheritance. And we, uh, just let me give a short explanation, and then I'm done. So in the case of niche construction, uh, what is the basic idea? The basic idea is following. Usually, the, I mean, this is the tacit assumption you know, that there are environmental factors and the classical way of adaptation by natural selection, that you are becoming more and more aligned with the environment. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> organisms are active, right? So they are modifying their environment. And then you find many examples of constructed niches, as it were. In the case of bacteria, it's biofilms. The beaver dam is a constructed niche. The termite mound is a constructed niche. And you know, the, the, the amazing thing is that this construction that was created by one generation can actually be inherited by the next generation. And it's a very important effect on their lives. Huh? So niche construction 
apparently uh, is a reality, right? It hasn't been analyzed that much by some theoretical evolution people, but it's a reality and it's very important. And if you look around, humans are definitely living in a, in a highly constructed niche, right? Now, the ecological inheritance, what does it mean? That means what it is here. The passing on to descendants of inherited resources and conditions and associated modified selection pressures through niche construction. I think that's, again, valid and fine, and the phenomenon is important. But what is this? Huh? What is this base? What, there is still a, an important difference, uh, and also a research program. You see? If you think about go back, you know, already go, you go back to Fashtetich. You go back to mutations, right? In biological evolution, a mutation becomes inheritable, right? Yeah, suppose that the beaver makes by accident, not because it is genetically different, but by accident, it makes a beaver dam which is morphologically different from a previous one. Suppose that it is also good. It's a good uh, mistake. Question is whether this variation in the beaver then, and the variation not, is not in the genes and the head of the beaver, but the variation is in the construction. Of, will this variation be passed on to the next generation of beaver then? or not, that is the main, that's the million dollar question. So if somebody in the future will find a case, at least a case, and then probably there will be many, that these kinds of things in ecological inheritance at least have some heritability which is not in the genetic information, even in the broad sense of the constructors, then our view of evolution and inheritance will have been broadened considerably, but not before that. So the phenomenon is there, but how important it is, that depends on the quantitative investigations that are open to the future. And uh, with this, thank you.